Thank you. Thanks so much for the song. And I'm a dad too. I've got two daughters. Um, this wasn't part, part of the speech, but just watching that song, now you gotta hear it. Uh, thank you. Yeah, I have two daughters, and I've, I've written about my family in my books, and I've written about my daughters. I was a bachelor for 39 years. There's a lot of reasons for that. We don't have time to get into it today. But, but when I got married, when I, when I met my wife, uh, she, she was a single mom. She had a three-year-old daughter. If you've read my books, you know uh, I refer to her as my given daughter. And I feel that I was given a great blessing. And her father and I have always kept in communication. And we made a pact when we first met that we would do our best for that child. And just last two weeks ago, we both were at a graduation sitting together. And uh, so I'm just... <laughs> I'm just very, very grateful that the world works out sometimes. My favorite story about having what, what some would call a blended family so I have the given daughter, and then I have, we have a second daughter. She was born at home in our old farmhouse. Um, I wrote about that in a book called Coop, or some refer to it, Co-op. <laughs> Which is fine, it just wasn't my plan. <clears throat> but the, when that little, our second one was born at home, I, to describe the, how our families interact, our, my given daughter's father and I, they live in Colorado. He's since married, has two uh, sons, so she has two brothers. We visit each other, and like I said, for the last 15 years, we've tried to do our best to, to raise uh, our daughter together, even apart. And uh, one of the ways that I explain our relationship in a nutshell is that throughout the pregnancy with our second daughter, we, of course, have been in contact with our Colorado family, as I refer to them. The big day arrives, the midwife is there, we're upstairs in our old farmhouse. My wife uh, gives birth, the child is safely cradled in her arms, and my given daughter, who at that time is seven, is just beside herself saying, can I call my dad, can I call my dad, and let him know, and I said, absolutely. Call our Colorado family, let them know we have a new sister. She goes running down the stairs, I hear her pick up the phone, I hear her dial, I hear his voice at the other end, and with no preface whatsoever, she says, well, you're a dad again. <laughs> so happy dang Father's Day. <clears throat> I don't know that I have any real credentials to be here today. I'm just mostly going to tell stories. That's what I do. Um, but I am somewhat, a part, not somewhat, I am part of your community. Uh, at back home on an old greenery that was built in 1946, we have a 24 panel array, a 4200 watt system. I only know that because I wrote it down. <laughs> uh, it was installed by a, 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 a friend of mine, some of you will know him, his name is Zeus. Uh, people here that, yeah, some of you know Zeus. One of my favorite stories about Zeus is if you tell people you have a friend named Zeus, they say, well, that's quite an unusual name. And I said, yeah, it is, until you find out that's his middle name, which he uses because his first name is Buffalo. <laughs> his parents were a member of the counterculture, uh, believe it or not. Uh, but Zeus is one of my favorite kind of people, and I don't know if I'm going to offend anybody with anything I say today. If I am, this will be the first one. Um, <laughs> but I saw, the, I saw the word used in some of, the, uh, some of the literature for this very festival. Zeus, Zeus is one of my favorite people in the world because he's a hippie who knows how to make payroll. <laughs> and, and he works really hard uh, to, to bring good things to this earth, but he also knows about sales tax and stuff like that. Um, I would say that we're kind of beta testers. We got our uh, panels about 10 years ago. Um, we have an old decrepit farmhouse, so in a way we did it backwards. You probably should have built a better house first, but it's been wonderful uh, even today just to know that there's some electricity coming down from the sky back home. Um, I don't know much about our, our system. As I said, Zeus did teach me that it's, 
it's photovoltaic, not a solar panel. And he informed me that we are members of the PV community. So I'll try to behave accordingly. <laughs> um, the only other thing I got to tell you uh, that I know about solar panels, uh, photovoltaic panels, is it's really cool if you have an old granary and it turns out that the it faces south and the angle of the roof is i think it was within two and a half degrees of what it needed to be anyway so it's really cool to put them up there until winter comes and then you got to get the snow off the panels and they're up on top of the granary so uh, think ahead is all <laughs> i'm saying uh, i was asked today to speak in general terms to the idea of and I quote from the email, intersectionality and the human condition. I will do that. I don't know how effective it'll be or how oblique it will be. Um, I do have a lot of intersectionality in my life. I come from very rough stock. I was raised by loggers, farmers, and truckers. I wound up making most of my living in the world of art, dancers, poets, musicians. And I'm constantly back and forth between those two worlds. When I'm back home, I'm living in rural Fall Creek. I'm on the volunteer fire department. And then when I go on the road, um, sometimes I'm speaking in universities and at art events. So I, I go back and forth. And even in my own home, my wife, she was a, she's a Fall Creek farm girl. She was raised working hard and driving pickup trucks. But she's also spent, she's more educated than I am. She has a master's. And she spent time, she's bilingual, she spent time in Central America studying shamanism. And she's, I don't know if they actually have, like, it, like in the martial arts, but she's studied yoga very deeply and intensely for over a decade now. I guess if I had to s express it, I would say she's like a third degree rainbow belt. Um, yeah. So here I am, I'm this roughneck from Chippewa County who, and I have a nursing degree and you know, pretty much studied Western medicine. I'm open-minded, I'm receptive to alternative things. Um, but sometimes in our marriage, just once we had the kids, it came, you know, the kid will be looking a little peaked and my wife will say, well, I think we should burn some sage. And, and I say, well, couldn't we just go to urgent care? So even at home, I'm in between. And I, I don't always know, I don't have a specific plan when I speak. I, I have lots of material, but I don't always know where I'm headed. I, my, I'm very, very scattered, even on a day-to-day -day basis. I, I can't keep anything straight in my head. When I write books, I have to print them out from rough draft all the way through to the end, cut them up with scissors, lay them out on tables, move them around, because I, I can't hold anything up here. And so I'm always forever going off on tangents, and I, I, I describe myself as having functional ADD. And I have a daughter who struggled mightily with that uh, disorder, and so I don't take it lightly. But in general, that's how I describe how my brain works. A, a good example is I got a call out of the blue one day from an editor. He was putting together an anthology of Midwestern writing. And he said, we would like you to write a 10,000-word essay on Wisconsin. That was it. That was the extent of his instructions. Well, the way that my head works is I go, OK, well, let's see Wisconsin. Wisconsin reminds me of cows. Cows remind me of milk. Milk reminds me of cheese. Cheese reminds me of cheese heads. Cheese heads remind me of the Green Bay Packers. And the Packers remind me of the meaning of life. <laughs> And as long as you can keep track of all them tangents and bring them back to where you started, that's called an essay. <laughs> and you can sell them, <laughs> which is great news for me. I got in trouble, I already mentioned you, know, when I said functional ADD, and, um, I, I, I think that when I use the term, I make it clear I'm speaking lightly and in a humorous vein, but you never know. And I said that at a writer's conference one day, and unbeknownst to me, in the audience, was a licensed clinical psychologist. And the next day, she sent me an email, a very detailed and specific email, in which she said, you do not have ADD. The symptoms you described are consistent with flight of ideas, which is associated with a completely different manic depressive disorder. <laughs> I thought, well, whatever it takes. Um, Plus, as a guy who's been buying his own health insurance since 1992, I thought, you know what? I got diagnosed for free. So. <laughs> but I am going to start out today 
start out, he says. What are we, 15 minutes in already? So I am going to start out today with a story that I've, I tell at almost all my speaking engagements. I know there are people in the room who have already heard it, but i just like to start because it centers me. It also lets you know where I'm from, my background. I simply wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for a book called Population 485. The book Population 485... And It's that old Can You Go Home Again book. It's been written many, many times by many different people, many different ways. In my case, I wrote about going back to my hometown of New Auburn, Wisconsin, after being away for 12 years. And I'm pretty much a loner. I keep to myself, but, to, to, I, but I wanted in some way uh, to belong to the community, to be supportive of the community. I don't drink, so I didn't go to any of the taverns. Uh, I don't go to any of the churches. Uh, I don't bowl. I don't play softball and I can't polka. So there wasn't much left, uh, so I just joined the local volunteer fire department. And that's how I rediscovered the neighborhood and uh, the people in the place, one call at a time, one fire call, one ambulance call at a time. Now, <clears throat> since that book has come out, and it's now been over 16 years, I've received and continue to receive, had one just this week, emails and letters from all over the US from people saying, we read your book about life in the small town and we loved it. We loved it so much that we've sold everything and we're moving to a small town. And I'll say, well, hang on there, Spanky. Because small towns can be difficult places. They got long memories. You can be 50 years old trying to live down something that happened when you was 15 in the gravel pit. And even I, I was returning of my own free will. I was eager to go back to New Auburn. Ultimately, I had 12 of the most meaningful years of my life back in New Auburn. But even I had a certain amount of trepidation, and that was based on the fact that I was not the same guy when I went back to New Auburn as I was when I left. What I like to say is that when I left New Auburn, I was a farm boy, a good student, and a fair defensive end. I returned 12 years later a long-haired writer with soft hands and a nursing degree. <laughs> so there's a certain amount of street cred to recover with some of my buddies in the coon hunting crowd. <laughs> now, I've since had to update the anecdote specifically as it pertains to the long hair. For years, and there are people in this room who can verify this, I had long hair, waist length. There are two reasons I no longer have long hair, and the first, sadly, is just generalized crop failure. <laughs> Just got to the point where there was no point. And the other reason is it had started to get real thin on top. It was still real long in back. I was looking in the mirror one day and I said, you know, I, you, you're headed for the Ben Franklin look. Um, you really probably better just cut it off. But I hadn't made the move yet and then we got paged out to fight a grass fire on the railroad track south of town. I was right up in the teeth of the flames, fighting from the black, as any well-trained wildland firefighter will tell you that you must. But I was right up in there, and all of a sudden, one of the other firefighters ran up and started patting me. <laughs> now, normally, you don't get a lot of that. <laughs> so I said, what are you doing? And he said, man, your hair's on fire. <laughs> and indeed, it was crackling right along. So. At that point, I thought, you know, if it ain't falling out, it's bursting into flames and it's going to cut it all off. And then, of course, I had to overcome all of the nurse, male nurse stereotypes. I'd heard them all. Um, so the deal with me is I grew up on this small little dairy farm north of New Auburn and grew up milking cows, baling hay. In the winter, we logged. Uh, then at the age of 16, I started to work in summers on a, a working beef and hay ranch out in Wyoming. And, and as I said, it was a regular working ranch. Uh, road Roundup, did branding, worked on the hay crew. Uh, and I was, so I would work at the, on the ranch as a cowboy all summer, and then I would take, for the next five years, I'd take my wages from working as a cowboy, and I'd apply them towards my, my college tuition. I'm here to tell you that I was the only cowboy in all of Wyoming who was putting himself through nursing school. <laughs> I based this on several conversations I had around the old Brandon fire. I was what they call a header, which meant they'd rope the calves, they'd bring them in, I would meet the horse, grab the rope, slide down the rope till I came in contact with the calf, throw the calf, 
wrestle it, as they said in the day, and then I would hold it while it was branded. So I would be down on the ground having wrestled this calf, and some crusty old cowboy would walk up behind me with a red-hot branded iron, and he'd say, where are you from, son? <laughs> Wisconsin. <laughs> well, what do you do? I'm going to college. <laughs> what for? I want to be a nurse. <laughs> they get really quiet out there on the prairie. And I will never forget the night I told my dad I wanted to be a nurse. I wasn't too worried. My father is a very gentle man, a hard-working farmer. But nonetheless, you're a 17-year-old guy. You're the leading tackler on the New Auburn Trojans football team. And you decide, tonight's the night I'm going to tell dad I want to be a nurse. It's a moment. <laughs> So we was walking out to the barn after supper to milk the cows, and I was, I was about five paces behind him. I said, Dad, I want to be a nurse. And he stopped, and he turned, and he looked at me, and he said, Well, your mother is a nurse. It's a noble profession. I think you'll make a fine nurse. And he turned to walk to the barn. Then he stopped and turned back. He said, there is just one thing. And I, I said, what's that? And he said, I just want to be there when they pin that little white cap on you. <laughs> so anyways, yeah, happy Father's Day. So, so anyways, I get back to New Auburn after 12 years away and I'm just looking for signs to tell myself whether I've made the right decision. And the story that I've told so many times is that the biggest event of the year in New Auburn, population 485, is Jamboree Days. Jamboree Days consist basically of a five minute parade and a softball tournament. And the proceeds from the softball tournament go to support the local park. So as members of the volunteer fire department, we're expected to pitch in and help run the softball tournament fundraiser. Now, in addition to the softball tournament, directly adjacent to the softball field, there is a beer tent. We run the beer tent as well, and I ain't gonna lie to you, that's where most of the fundraising happens. Now, at the time of this story, New Auburn has only one softball field and no lights on the softball field. The tournament had become very popular, so in order to get all the teams through the brackets, they have to start playing softball at 8 a.m. on Saturday morning. They play all day long until dark. They resume play at 8 a.m. on Sunday morning and play all day long until the tournament has been resolved. So shortly after I moved back, still trying to decide if I made the right decision, I get assigned the duty of going down to the tent on Sunday morning of Jamboree Days with one of the old timers on the department uh, to clean up the beer tent, get it ready for the day. And they send me down there with a guy named Bob the One-Eyed Beagle. And the Beagle's a butcher, he's still a friend of mine, he just made some sausage for me just last month. Um, he's, uh, so he's been on the department for over 30 years at that point. He's, uh, he's one of these guys, he, he, the, he gets his nickname, the One-Eyed Beagle, from the fact that he is severely cross-eyed. And when I say severely, when, that, that one eye is not just a little bit off, it's shot. If his good eye is looking due south, that other eye is looking due east. And there's always a little bit of discomfort when I talk about that. And indeed, I've had people come up to me afterward uh, and say, you know, it's, it's very insensitive the way that you talk about the fact that your friend uh, has, has a crossed eye. And, and I, you know, he's a buddy of mine. I just look at him and go, uh, he's aware. <laughs> he, he's checked it out in the mirror and everything, you know, from both angles. Um, plus, he's one of these guys, uh, and you all know this guy, that's the beauty of this. That eye is the least of his problems, okay? <laughs> this is a guy, he's got one eye, one kidney, and two ex-wives, both of whom work at the only gas station in town. <laughs> So he's got to run nine miles south to Bloomer every morning for gas, coffee, and chew, because they ain't dealing with him there at the home place. So anyways, me and the Beagle, we get sent down to the, to the park at 8.30 a.m. on Sunday morning to clean up the beer tent. It's 8.30 a.m., we get down there, the first softball game of the day is already underway, 
We're in the beer tent picking up paper plates and plastic cups and napkins when this guy wanders in off the street, uh, not a softball player, just a civilian, and he says, can I get a beer? And I said, well, it is 8.30 a.m. on Sunday morning, but Beagle, you've been on the department longer, you make the command decision. And the Beagle says, well, I guess there's no law against it. So he goes around behind our little makeshift bar there and he draws the guy a beer and he sets it down. The guy puts his elbows down on the plywood and he lifts the beer to his lips and he's just about to take a pull at the phone when he hears the crack of the bat on the softball field to Jason and he freezes and he looks and he brings his lips back in line with the beer which has not moved and says a little early in the morning for softball <laughs> said, yes, I am back among my people. <laughs> so I, I don't really know how the writing thing happened. Um, I'm a farm kid with a nursing degree who wound up writing. Um, people ask me, so I, I write a weekly column, and, I, and half the year I do a weekly radio show, and then I do magazine articles and write books, as many as I can, as fast as I can. I got that 18-year-old wants to go to college now and the 11 year old is still eating every day. Um, so, I mean, it's, I'm self-employed in the writing uh, business. People say, well, how do you keep coming up with ideas? Like, I have to come up with a column idea 50 times a year, so almost every week I have to come up with a column idea, whether I'm feeling inspired or not. And people say, well, you know, isn't it hard to keep coming up with good ideas? And I go, yeah, I mean, have you read the column lately? <laughs> But honestly, they say, no, really, how do, how do you come by ideas? And I say, well, a lot of times I just wait for one of my brothers to call. <laughs> and that gets a nice little chuckle, but it's absolutely true. I can go through columns and go, yeah, that one, that one, that one. And there's an example. I was at my desk one day, and I had about two hours until the hard deadline. There's just no getting out of it once you hit the hard deadline. I can't, I can't fake it. And I got nothing but false starts. And I'm just, I'm starting to get the, the nervous failure sweats and, and all of a sudden my phone rings, it's my brother John calling. And I pick up the phone, and my brother John, he's this bearded, backwards looking guy, he's got a dump truck and a skid steer, he's, just, he's that guy. If you, need, if you need your driveway worked on or a culvert put in, he's that guy. And he's calling to tell me uh, that he was working in his shop on his bench grinder when the stone exploded and a chunk of it flew off and punched a hole in his neck um, and just missed his carotid artery. Um, so basically, he's calling to tell me that it was an eighth of an inch from a memorial service to a really excellent story. <laughs> Because if you grew up like I did with roughnecks and loggers and farmers, like nothing's funnier than somebody getting hurt, right? <laughs> once you establish, you know, if, some, if your buddy gets hit in the head with a monkey wrench, once you establish that he's still breathing and he's probably going to be able to walk again, nothing's funnier than your buddy getting hit in the head with a monkey wrench. <laughs> I was just raised that way. We had an old farmer that, that, that we worked for growing up, and he was this quiet, kind, hardworking guy. There was only one time you'd ever see him giggle, and that was if you got hurt. I remember helping him fill silo one time, and I stood up underneath the downspout on the silo and just rang it like a church bell, and I'm staggering around there, and, and he's looking at me, and, and I could just see him going. <laughs> he finally goes, are you going to be all right? <laughs> and I said, I think so, and he just fell apart laughing. But, but I got revenge on him because uh, one day he had a beautiful herd of Holstein milk cows, one of the nicest in the county, and unfortunately there came a day when his best milk cow took ill. So he called my other brother, Jed, and he said, um, this cow is not going to make it, the vet's been out, and she's just getting worse, and now she can't stand, and she's clearly in discomfort. 
And as you did in those days, he said, could you just come over with your deer rifle and put the cow out of her misery? And my brother Jed said, yeah, I'll, I'll be right over. And so my brother Jed comes over, he goes up in the manger with the rifle and he dispatches the cow. Well, then of course you have to get the dead cow out of the barn. And so my brother backs the tractor up to the barn door, runs a cable from the back of the tractor all the way to the stanchion, takes a hitch around the one hind leg of the cow, and then gets back on the tractor and just very slowly and respectfully starts pulling the cow out of her stanchion and out of the barn. And poor Jerry, the farmer, is standing there. This is his best milk cow. And he's standing over her, watching her being dragged dead from the stanchion. What he doesn't notice is that the cable has pulled the cow's one hind leg this way, uh, but the other hind leg has got hung up in the stanchion and is being bent back like the arm on a trebuchet. <laughs> and Jerry had one bad knee, and when that cow's hoof cleared the stanchion, it whipped around and smashed him right in the bad knee. So he's bouncing around on one leg, tears streaming down his face, and my brother Jed stops the tractor and he says, you gonna be all right? <laughs> and Jerry says, I think so. And my brother Jed says, because I got one more shell. <laughs> so anyways, my brother John is calling to tell me about getting hurt. And he's calling, he, he's calling to say, as I said, that this chunk of shrapnel basically flew off and punched a hole in, in, in his neck. Or, or as he said, yeah, got me right in the gozzle. <laughs> I hadn't heard the term gozzle in years. Um, but anyways, I, so I said, well, where are you calling me from? And he said, oh, the parking lot at Farm and Fleet. <laughs> I said, well, what are you doing there? And he said, oh, I'm, I'm going to go in and get me one of them full frontal face masks. I'm pretty sure that's not what it says on the box. He says, yeah, everybody always told me that if you're gonna use one of them grinders, you should always wear a full frontal face mask. I always thought that was pretty silly, but this has been a behavior altering experience. <laughs> So of course I'm just <laughs> send <laughs> 45 minutes to spare. <laughs> so I'm going to switch gears here now and uh, I'll read a little bit from the most recent book I wrote and talk a little bit about it just because it speaks the most directly to the. Uh, some of the things that we're all trying to sort through. And also, it spoke to the intersectionality that I was asked to, to speak about. Um, so I'll, I'll read a little bit from that, and, and then I'm also gonna make some time for questions, and then I have a short piece when it's time to close. Um, I'm a little nervous about one passage in here, but we'll see how she goes. So this is a book about a guy named Michel de Montaigne. He was a French philosopher. Uh, people have built entire careers parsing just one of his essays. Uh, so I was sitting in my deer stand reading him on my iPhone, and I thought, I think the world needs to hear what I have to say <laughs> about 16th century French philosophy. <laughs> I recently tested an electrified pig fencer by grabbing it with my bare hands. As the fibrillations dispersed, I regarded the unit, now pulsing in the grass some 15 feet distant, where it landed after I spastically flung it, dumbly, then resolved to take the rest of the afternoon off and curl up with the late Michel de Montaigne's essay of the inconsistency of our actions. If you recognize the name Michel de Montaigne, you have a head start on me. If you don't recognize the name Michel de Montaigne, well, neither did I, at least not until I birthed my first kidney stone. The journey began on a gurney, whereupon I flopped all sweaty and stricken. The stone put me through the sort of contortions your leading yogis only dream of. I was self-insured with a catastrophic health plan that allowed me to pay for one ambulance ride, two emergency room visits, and some excellent drugs all out of my own pocket. 
It might have been entrepreneurial tenacity in the face of a four-figure deductible, or it might have been the intravenous Tordal. But at some point, while prostrate in a penniless Percocet haze, I had a vision that I might convert my agony into cash by writing a personal essay about the experience. I started taking notes and kept taking them until the moment two weeks later when I peed out what appeared to be the devil's own gobstopper. <laughs> Next, I set out to bolster my personal observations by reading several medical journals on the subject of renal calculi. A number of authors referenced a 16th century French nobleman, Michel de Montaigne, born in 1533, who had documented his own kidney stone experience. I looked him up, bought his book, read the kidney stone excerpts. Then I got drawn into his essay about thumbs. And then I read the one about the sexual danger of coaches, the kind with horses, not the kind with bad shorts and whistles. <laughs> and another essay about cannibalism, and then one about marriage, and another about flatulence. The guy would write about anything. I discovered it is generally agreed that Michel de Montaigne invented the essay form, for which I thank him, as it allowed me to convert our shared affliction into cash. But after my kidney stone essay was published, I kept reading Montaigne, fits and starts, bits and pieces here and there, but I've never really stopped, all thanks to a crippling pain in my flank. Last evening near midnight, I was called away from the keyboard to help fight a fire. The flames roared and spit sky high as we pulled hose. The house as good as gone, even as it stood. I'd been writing on deadline with a newspaper column due come morning. As my neighbor's home boiled into ash, the clickety-click musings I'd been stitching together evaporated to irrelevance in a flash. Over the course of my years, I've deployed hundreds of thousands of words, primarily in pursuit of next month's house payment. I draw from my heart, but my eye is always on the mortgage. As a writer, I can neither claim nor hold the intellectual high ground. Having closely observed great writers and great fires, I know that my keystrokes are short-lived sparks sent flittering into the void, my books a match struck in a monsoon. When I leave this life, my most meaningful acts will have been performed not at the writing desk, but at the behest of a volunteer fire department pager. And even then, I am frequently party to a team presiding over defeat. Montaigne once wrote, good God, my lady, how I would hate the reputation of being clever at writing, but stupid and useless at everything else. Yeah, buddy. <laughs> Every time my old snowplow truck won't start, I lift the hood, understand nothing, and long for some fourth dimension where it is possible to replace a bad starter with a nifty simile. <laughs> I come from a family of eminently practical people, most of them equipped to perform fundamental functions along the lines of heavy machinery operation, projects involving electricity on purpose, <laughs> the design and production of roads and basements and cell phone cases and hay bales, military service, and so on, whereas I peddle words and three-chord songs. When blue collar is your background, you never lose the idea that unless you can stack it or stack with it, it doesn't count. A stack of books? Dubious. Michel de Montaigne once cast words and language as a merchandise so vulgar and vile that the more a man has, the less he is probably worth. And yet, he spent the last 22 years of his life cranking out reams of that very merchandise. Thank goodness. Based on our backgrounds, I wouldn't expect to find much in common with Michel de Montaigne. He is permanently deceased in France. I am temporarily alive in Wisconsin. He was a nobleman born to nobility. I was born to a paper mill worker and a nurse. He was privately tutored in Latin from the age of two and enrolled in the University of Toulouse to study law when he was 14. I matriculated as a barn-booted bumpkin who still marks a second place finish in the sixth grade spelling bee as an intellectual pinnacle. 
He served with the military, held several high-level government positions, roamed around Europe, and hung out with the Pope. I am on the volunteer fire department, had a brief run on the high school student council, went hitchhiking in 1989, and once said hello to Merle Haggard. <laughs> and here's where the trail really splits. At the age of 38, Montaigne retired to the family estate, desiring, as he put it, to spend the rest of his days in the bosom of the learned virgins. Gosh, I wish I'd have thought of that. <laughs> From then until he kicked the bucket, Montaigne composed essays while ensconced in a castle tower overlooking his vineyards. I typed that sentence while ensconced in a room above the garage overlooking a defunct pig pen. <laughs> so I'm going to skip ahead now to the, the toughest chapter for me to write. Um, it's chapter two, and it's called Roughneck Intersectionality. And I'm just going to touch on it. Uh, it goes far more in depth on much more complicated social issues. Um, it's also resonant in the book Population 45. The toughest chapter I ever wrote was the chapter called My People. And the reason it was tough is because I wanted to be honest and I wanted to be fair, but I also had to examine my own um, perspectives and how they came to be. Um, and this. I would say that the chapter Roughneck Intersectionality is an echo of that chapter some 15 years later. Michel de Montaigne died in 1592 and was thus unable to attend the 2013 Augusta Bean and Bacon Days Demolition Derby. <laughs> His loss because my daughters and I were there and we had a blast. The Demolition Derby was the concluding event of a three-day culture tour that began at the Great River Shakespeare Festival in Winona, Minnesota. The festival was our younger daughter's first exposure to the bard, and I was pleased to see her alternately transfixed and giggling throughout. It helped that the performance in question was Twelfth Night, which contains enough cross-guarded silliness to hold a first grader's interest. On day two of this artful ramble, we traveled to a farm just down the road and joined a potluck crowd assembled to watch our octogenarian neighbor, Tom, fire his homemade cannon. <laughs> I wrote a whole book about him. It's called Visiting Tom. He makes his, his favorite thing in the world is to make his own cannons and shoot them. Um, and they're not little toys like his main cannon, the one he'll shoot for if you come over the barrel alone weighs 300 pounds. He turned it on his own lathe. Everything in that cannon, from the wheel rims to the spokes to the, to the uh, caisson, he built it all by hand himself. He even makes his own black powder, um, which is a slightly extra legal operation. <laughs> but I always joke that if he gets nervous about the ATF busting him for his illegal powder making operation, he calms his nerves by going in the other shed and uh, taking a slash off the moonshine. <laughs> He also, he doesn't shoot cannonballs, he shoots Dinty Moore beef stew cans filled with concrete. <laughs> they kind of knuckleball a little bit. But. So, day one Shakespeare, day two Tom's Cannon, and then on day three, the Demolition Derby, where a bellowing herd of junkyard fugitives smash customized clunkers into one another until just a single surviving vehicle is capable of meaningful linear motion. Meanwhile, hundreds of spectators drink, holler, and gorge on deep fry, separated from the carnage by foam earplugs and a safety barrier of quarter-inch laugh. <laughs> My girls were wide-eyed and joyous in the dust. If you do not want more dullness, Montaigne once said, you must accept a touch of madness. As we departed the fairgrounds, I asked my daughters if they'd had a nice time at both the play and the derby. It was a leading question. I was setting myself up for a chance to deliver a lecture concerning the pit in Shakespeare's Globe Theater, where for a penny, groundlings could stand on shucked nutshells and watch art they could otherwise not afford. Back then, I concluded, the same people who were at the demolition derby would also have gone to see the Twelfth Night. I was hoping my daughters might intuit that cultural consumption can be affected on a sliding scale, including down there where it's greasy. 
that both couplets and carburetors sing. They seemed to take the point, and I didn't want to overdo it, so I turned the radio on and handed off to Justin Bieber. <laughs> I first encountered the word intersectionality while wasting time on Twitter. Retrospectively speaking, I wasn't actually wasting time since this tangent led in turn to my Googling the term and learning that academics deploy it in reference to the ways our social identities overlap or intersect in relation to systems of oppression and discrimination. I mention this to be clear. My use of the word begins there, but wanders off the academy lawn almost immediately, heading straight for, among other places, the demolition derby where if I do not use it correctly in the strictest sense, if I have bastardized or bowdlerized it, it nonetheless serves as a point of reconnoiter for fine-tuning my perspective. I operate from a position of privilege by a multitude of definitions. I have encountered resistance here and there, mostly predicated on presumptions based on class and geography, but the slights are so slight they are worthy of consideration only in the interest of extrapolation. Based on the fact that I live in rural Wisconsin, a Manhattan-based publicist once called me to say she was planning a book release party for my neighbors and me, and to that end wondered where she might rent gingham tablecloths and genuine straw bales. <laughs> I guess she assumed I'd supply my own overalls and banjo. <laughs> I almost went for it because as it happened, my brother possessed a barn full of straw bales, which I am confident he would have made available at his very special book release party rental rate. <laughs> and furthermore, cut me in on a sweet 15%. <laughs> But in the end, I respectfully declined without getting into any discussion about how the last thing my neighbors really want to do is sit around on straw bales while the Perry kid reads at them. <laughs> I had another little set too with them over this book cover. I said, I want to be able to imply that even though this is about French philosophy, that there's a sense of humor. And so I said, I want you to put the picture of Montaigne on the cover, but I want him to be wearing a blaze orange ear flapper cap. <laughs> well, the award-winning, nationally recognized graphic designer who does the book covers had never heard of a blaze orange ear flapper cap. <laughs> so I had to send him some pictures of mine. And then I even went to the trouble of going to a buddy of mine in Eau Claire, Wisconsin, who's a graphic designer, and getting the specific, whatever that is, CMY, CMYK number or whatever, for Hunter Orange, Blaze Orange, the real one. And I sent it to them in New York and I said, it is critical that you use this color orange, not just any color orange. Just, yeah. Two months later, they send me a mock-up and everything looks lovely except the orange. It isn't even close. And so I emailed them back. And this, by the way, happened to be the week after a very significant election. And I said, I asked you to use that one color. You gotta use that color. And the people in New York emailed back and said, we don't think people will know the difference. And I might have said, now you know why we're in the fix we're in. So, here and there, in and out of print, I've been culturally condescended to by certain rare talents often due to my willingness to write for utilitarian hire, sell books from the back of my van, and crack cow jokes for cash. That I can handle. In fact, it can be good fun when the rare talents are so turgid in their self-assurance they fail to imagine you might know you're being condescended to. One revels in the moment of smiling benignly, a nifty bit of mental jujitsu in which the condescendee condescends to the condescendent. Some call it country dumb. <laughs> In an episode of the Partially Examined Life podcast, one of the hosts comments on Montaigne's lovely non-aristocratic air, but questions whether he understood how privileged he was. Despite all I have written, I believe he did understand, not perfectly, and with great moral qualifications. 
but his childhood experience lent him a tempering that at the very least caused him to pause for critical consideration of class inequities as an adult. His parents chose for his godparents peasants and had him live with peasants for the first few years of his life. Now that in itself is problematic uh, from certain perspectives, but nonetheless it informed his outlook. Recalling, as far as class inequities are concerned, recalling his experiences as a magistrate, he harbored no illusions about how courts disadvantage the poor. They have neither the skill nor the money to prove their innocence, he wrote. And when he writes elsewhere, it is inhuman and unjust to make so much of this accidental privilege of fortune, we are almost certainly hearing echoes from his childhood. So, privileged, yes, but not of what I call the blithe riche. My most recent with visit with the blithe riche came to pass in the Minneapolis airport. I was waiting for a flight to California. Two young women on the bench adjacent me were looking over a young man's shoulder as he sent a text. I told her we have to stay at a Super 8, said the man, and all three collapsed in hoots and cackles. Each of the trio was fairly slim, clad and accessorized as if posed in a high gloss cologne ad, and as oblivious to the rest of us as if we were buttons on the Naga hide. While they waited for a reply, the man said, we should just go out there a day earlier and do Napa or Sonoma or something like that. The word do fell from his lips like a dead hornet. The phone pinged, their three heads clustered at the screen, and then it was hoots and cackles again. She believes you, said one of the women. She's freaking, said the other. And I realized they pranked their friend by pretending they'd been forced to book a room in a chain motel. The same chain, coincidentally, where I was bound to bunk that weekend. <laughs> them, fo them folks and me, I don't think we travel well together. Let's just say where I come from, when you say Napa, we think car parts. <laughs> so uh, in the interest of time, I'm going to skip ahead a little bit. The passage then goes on to address uh, how I say that the Blythe Reach revert me to full roughneck. Um, I grew up poor but not deprived, and I talk about those qualifications. Um, and I also talk about, in this passage, and again, too long today, but why um, I no longer, ref you know, I grew up calling myself a redneck, and I won't use that term anymore, because I feel, um, well, as I said figuratively, the term as I envisioned it, intended it, was affiliated in my mind with pickup trucks and fishing and good people doing honest work without pretension. I wish it were still so. But over time, two things happened. One, the phrase lapsed into irrelevant triteness. Too many country music singers, flanked by their fashion consultants and stubble advisors, <laughs> reassuring me they were rednecks. Secondly, there was the ever-growing prevalence of perverse pride in which a term of self-deprecation became more and more a badge of dumbed-down bellicosity. I have my pride. I have my stubborn pride. I have my stubborn provincial pride. But when pride blinds me to reflection, and even more importantly, compassion, it's time to reconsider. So here's the part that I'm the most nervous about. I'm just going to plow through it, and then I'll go to questions. <laughs> you write something, and you have no idea. You know, there are some things you write, you go, oh boy, I'm going to get hammered. And then you write something pretty innocently, and that's the one. You get the emails, or the angry face emojis. <laughs> so this is me just trying to address intersectionality in a way that, outside academia. As proof that inattention to intersectionality can fester into trouble on unexpected fronts. Have you ever tried to gas up your log splitter using a non-spill fuel nozzle? <laughs> Scare quotes on the non-spill there. I own five non-spill nozzles, three different designs. Thanks to the only extra credit, or thanks only to extra credit, I pulled a lame B in my one college statistics course, but I'm gonna declare those five nozzles a representative sample. 
And based on my experience with that sample, snapped tabs, jammed valves, abysmally slow pour rates, supplemented by errant drips, spritzes, and outright hazmatic dam busters, my brash extrapolation is that the aggregate effect of the non-spill nozzle has been to beach a million miniature Exxon Valdezes upon America's backyards. <laughs> These nozzles are also purported to minimize the escape of volatile organic compounds, known in the trade as VOCs. In fact, so efficiently do they trap fumes that you will frequently find your square plastic gas can ballooned into the shape of a red rubber kickball. When you open the valve, that whoosh you hear is a flock of VOCs being released into the wild. Which, as they say, begs the question, Here's how you formally filled your fuel tank. Number one, remove cap from nozzle. Number two, pour fuel into tank. Here's how it goes with a non-spill nozzle. Number one, grunting like a Russian kettlebell instructor, hoist full fuel container to a point higher than the tank, and then invert it as it will not pour until two, downward pressure is applied against a spring-loaded valve which will not occur until three, the full weight of the full container is directed against a plastic tab the size of a gopher tooth. <laughs> which happens only after four, the tab catches on the lip of the fuel tank and Five, you simultaneously twist an enigmatically unresponsive plastic locking device, also spring-loaded, while six, fine-tuning the angle of the approach by thrusting your pelvis at the fuel can in the manner of a spasmodic pole dancer. <laughs> because your hands are both occupied, but seven, it's okay because finally the fuel is flowing. No, wait, it's not okay because eight, the gopher tooth just gave way, the nozzle plunged into the fuel tank, the weight of the full can snapped the nozzle at its base, and now there's raw fuel running everywhere. <laughs> now and then, I perform a humorous monologue that includes a bit on non-spill nozzles. There are always plenty of your NPR environmentally friendly types in the audience. <laughs> One Subaru, two Subaru. <laughs> there are always plenty of your NPR environmentally friendly types in the audience, and yet the wry laughter of recognition during the show and the comments in the signing line afterward, including surreptitious notes and whispered tips on how to obtain old school fuel noz nozzles on the down low, Bolster my sentiments. When your NPR types are trafficking in black market nozzles, you know you got a problem. <laughs> in true Montaigne style, let's throw her into reverse and back into this from another angle. While in the company of a self-employed, hardworking, and roughneck acquaintance I have known all my life and would trust, have trusted, particularly inside burning buildings, with my life, I told the story of the non-spill nozzle and how even NPR types agreed with me on that one. If I was expecting a nod or chuckle, I didn't get it. Those people are why we've got those things in the first place. I was taken aback at the turn. That's not true. Yes, it is. Both his tone and the elevation of his eyebrows indicated this was no longer a conversation, and I let it go. The exchange disturbed me for days, inordinately so. I felt weak and stupid for surrendering the floor. As a debater, I am a bag of cotton candy. My best reposts are found at the bottom of a 24-hour stew. But above all, I was disturbed by the certitude, the dismissive certitude of his those people line. I can do a pretty good riff on the well-earned well stereotypes of public radio, but I also know that unlike my conversation partner, I've shaken the hands of thousands of public radio listeners, 
and a not insignificant percentage of those hands are calloused. The fact that they laugh at the non-spill story indicates that not only do they get the irony, they've lived the irony. It's the sneer that's such a gut punch. The idea that we might have no more interest in examining our own hypotheses than those nozzle designers had in field testing the nozzle with a few farmers. In his piece, 12 Fundamentals of Writing the Other and the Self, Daniel Jose Older notes that every character has a relationship to power and that power plays out in everything from daily annoyances to historical community trauma. When I go to Farm and Fleet to find all the good nozzles removed by mandate, I feel powerless and thus disgruntled. But how self-indulgent is this boutique peak if it does not evolve into some understanding of those truly disenfranchised from power? Intersectionality only works for the good if I'm willing to hit the brakes, pause and wave the other person through. Recently, I observed from the digital sidelines as a gaggle of academics gasped and snarked about a literary festival panel member who dared admit she wasn't familiar with the term intersectionality. I wanted to ask the academics, can you tune a carburetor? Quick, without looking, can you spell carburetor? <laughs> so I'm going to leave it there. I go on then, as I said, to get into some of the more complex stuff. Um, I struck up a relationship with a, a sociologist VCU, uh, Dr. Tracy McMillan Cottom, who's written in depth about intersectionality, issues of race, um, and I don't feel equipped to say much beyond what I've read to you, but I guess I have another scene in the book where I was up in Canada fishing, and I was in a boat with this guy, man, and, and we, over the years, our two daughters, uh, they, our older daughter did a little bit of Montessori, a little bit of homeschooling, and then she finished up in a public charter that's an environmental project-based school. Our, our younger daughter has so far plowed right through uh, public school. We have a great local public school. We homeschooled her this year for some issues having nothing to do with the quality of the local school. So I'm on the boat fishing with this guy. We're in northern Canada. It's rural, it's had no electricity, everything is, he's got a generator. And um, he just started talking to me. We're hitting it off because he's a logger in the off season. He's my people. And then he started talking about all the things he was afraid of. And I just kept looking around and going, dude, there's none of that within a thousand miles of here. And then he said, you got kids? I said, well, we're, we're homeschooling the one. Good, good. And then I got you know, this whole rant about the thugs. The thug word came up and the liberal agenda in schools and stuff. And I said, eh, you know, I'm kind of a roughneck. I'm a deer hunter and whatnot, but I said, we've got a great public school. And then he spent the next 10 minutes telling me why I was wrong about my own personal experience. And then when I went back into the hot cabin with him, he had his generator on, and he had the type of person I refer to as a, well, I got this from the poet, the Irish poet Seamus Haney called them mouth athletes. <laughs> and so we went from that beautiful pristine lake in this, in this tiny little place in Canada a thousand miles from trouble, and we walked into his cabin and the generator had the mouth athlete just going nonstop. And the thought that I had, um, and I put in the book, is that sometimes if you just, if you just cocoon like that, man, you, you, you come to trust the man screaming in the distance rather than the person in the boat right beside you. And uh, I don't know what to do about it. I don't have answers. For me, a lot of my intersection happens on the fire department. Uh, I'm down to a handful of calls. I'm gone so much, I hardly make any calls anymore. And I keep saying to the chief, well, you can kick me off. He's like, no, we need you. They're so short-handed, you know. And, and they need people who are thoughtful and reflective to join up and just answer the call. And so for me, now, now I'm bragging because I made it sound like I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm just a bumbling guy trying to do my best. But for me, the, a lot of intersectionality happens at the fire department because I write in the book, my home county, voted for a man that I did not vote for. 70% of them voted for him. And I got a lot of emails and social media stuff from friends up and saying, you know, what are those idiots doing? And I said, well, here's the problem. Today, this minute, if my daughter hurts herself on our farm, those folks are gonna drop what they're doing, jump in the fire truck and come and help her. So it's not as, I can't just dismiss them. And again, I don't, I don't have an answer. I hope you can tell I'm struggling with it in real time, just like all you are. 
have one short piece I'm going to close with, but I did say that I'd, if anybody has questions, we could take a couple of minutes. I'm happy to do my best with them. Um, if you need to pin me to the wall about something, I don't know. And, and yes, I'm aware that they now have non-spill ones that have the handle on them, but I'm, I don't care. I still... <laughs> this, is there a question in the front? I'm happy to take that question. If this gentleman has a question, I'm happy to take it. This young gentleman in the front, and I had a nice visit with him, I wrote a book called The Scavengers, which is about young people trying to survive in a world that's kind of coming apart. And he was kind enough to, he liked the book well enough that he named his rooster after the rooster in the book, and that's a great honor for him. <laughs> so he just asked me, um, he asked me how many books I've written, and I'm going to be a bad adult and give you a political answer, which is, depends on how you count. Uh, I self-published my first four books when I was just trying to get anybody's attention, and then I've, uh, I think now I'm on my 12th or 13th book with uh, bigger publishers, and I'll just, uh, so I think probably somewhere between 12 and 18 books, depending on how you count. And I gotta keep typing, because um, last, uh, I was telling someone earlier, uh, I don't mind telling you, that's my tour bus right over there. Um, <laughs> So this is the approachable side, this is the blue collar side, there's no hubcaps, but uh, the other side has hubcaps. So that's, <laughs> if I'm pulling up to a fancy gig, I, I, let, I let them see the hubcaps. <laughs> I figured this was a no hubcap crowd. <laughs> One other recent anecdote that I'm sort of working up to put in the, in, in it has nothing to do with why we're here today, but I gotta tell it because there's this lovely little point, and again, I feel that this audience is filled with people who get this. So I was on tour a month ago, I went all over the state, and, and then I'm driving home, so I put on all these miles, and a lot of it on four lanes at 70 miles an hour. And then the day after I was home, I had to run into town for something. The day started off bad because um, we have a two-car garage, and my daughter uh, has the bay next to it, and she had gone to work, so I walked in through her bay, and I'm very absent-minded and off on tangents all the time, and I was thinking about all the things I had to do in town, and I got in that van, and I backed uh, into the garage door, which I had not opened. Um, <laughs> so that was a setback, number one. But then I went in town, did my stuff, and then on the way home, about two miles from home, thankfully out on a rural country road, I, I went around a corner, and I heard a clunk. That's no big deal. In that van, you hear clunks all the time. Then there was a second clunk. Well, I don't know what you guys, my rule is, two clunks, you gotta check. <laughs> so, I pulled very carefully over to the shoulder. I got out to check what the clunk was, and before I could even look, I heard a third clunk as the gas tank fell off the van and hit the... <laughs> so, I'm just glad it didn't happen on Highway 29 at 70 miles an hour, because as my brothers and I were talking, we're like, yeah, that's a situation where you got to keep going while you make a plan. Right? <laughs> so, so thankfully I was at a dead stop. It just falls off. So I call, we have a guy. You guys probably have a guy or, yeah, you have a, have a call a guy and, and, and um, I don't mean that in the sexist sense and maybe yours is a, is a see even there, whatever term I use, I get trouble, but, uh, so I have this guy, and he's a, he's what they would have called a shade tree mechanic, but ours works in an abandoned car wash, and, um, he specializes in vehicles like that, and so I called him from the roadside, I said, hey, I just found out I have towing on my insurance, so they're going to tow it, I was going to have them tow it to you, but I thought I'd better check first, can you, can you put the gas tank back on, and he said, oh, yeah, we do that all the time, he said, I just got to order the straps, and it wasn't until I got home, and I was talking to my wife, and I said to her, I said, what does it say about us? and the kind of cars we drive, that our mechanic is used to putting gas tanks back on. <laughs> if you call the Escalade dealership, they were like, oh no, we don't show it. Our guy's like, oh yeah, we put them back on all the time. So, did anybody have a question? And if not, I'll just, I'll head it home. And then I'll hang out here. Uh, I do have books and CDs for sale, but if some, somebody came up today just wanted to say hi, that's fine. If you brought your own book and you want to sign it, that's fine. Um, I am self-employed, am paying for my own health insurance, you know, so just do whatever you think. <laughs> do whatever you think is right, but here's another tangent I wasn't gonna tell, but so one time 
I was doing a, a one-man show in a theater, and I got off on this whole tangent about being a self-employed writer, and I mean it in the sense to convey that my brothers are self-employed, my dad's a self-employed farmer, so I relate in that sense. I don't mean it in that, you know, you should treat me special. No, I just, you just get up, like my dad got up and milked the cows every morning, he milked them every night, no one applauded, he just did it. And that's how I approach what I do, you just gotta get out there and do it. Um, but I do mention that it's a little uncertain, like my inspiration, people say, where do you get your inspiration? I go, well, my muse is a little bald-headed guy named Jimmy, sits in a swivel chair nine miles up the road from me at Chatech State Bank, and he holds my mortgage. <laughs> I'll write another book, he takes my house away. It's pretty simple, a symbiotic relationship. <laughs> but I like when the crowd gets the symbiotic joke. Um, so anyway, he, uh, well, so now I talk so long, I'm gonna forget it. But the point, the point is, I told, I did this whole riff about being self-employed, feeding my kids, you know, and it's supposed to be humorous and, and self-deprecating. And afterwards, I was selling books, and people were buying books, and I'm signing them. And then this woman comes through the line. She doesn't have a book or anything. She just puts a, a 20 down and slides a 20. <laughs> and I said, what, what do you, which book do you want? She goes, no. <laughs> and I said, oh, no, no. I said, things are fine. You know, I'm good. She's like. <laughs> and she wouldn't. She just made me take a 20. And so I got home, and I told my wife. I said, I was so embarrassed. I said, I really overdid it, apparently. But it, and my wife says, sounds to me like you should tell that story every time. <laughs> All right. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to wrap it up because it is, it is real warm. And I'm going to just close with one last piece. And um, this is one of those pieces. I wrote it having no idea. I thought it'd be a nice little column. It's wound up being one of the most quoted and repeated things I've ever written. And I'm, especially after some of the things we talked about today, I'd like to close with it for my own sake, if not yours. So thanks so much for having me. I have a website, sneezingcow.com. Comes from a humor album I did called Never Stand Behind a Sneezing Cow. <laughs> Shouldn't have to explain it here. When I'm on book tour on the West Coast in California, I gotta break out charts and everything. But <laughs> understand it. So thank you so much for having me. Thank you to the MREA. Uh, this has been a long time coming. So much. And thank you to you all. I just, as I said, I, I'm no good at leading the charge, but we got those solar panels. I'm talking to my neighbors, and there are a lot of us grateful for the inroads that are being made. And, you know, I just love it now when some of my rougher friends are going, well, you know, some of that solar stuff's all right. <laughs> yeah, all right. It happens that this essay is being composed in the waning days of December and thus on the cusp of a new year. I cannot anticipate the state of our hearts as we meet in this moment, but I choose for my subject a word I owe more study, whatever may transpire after I type it. Gratitude. Gratitude, such a lovely word, humble and warm. Humble because it's not a word you use if you think you did everything yourself. Humble because no matter how hard you did work at whatever it is you're grateful for, you know, and more importantly, acknowledge there was some luck involved. Warm because gratitude is not compatible with a cold soul. Warm because gratitude radiates like the gentle rays of a heart-sized sun. Gratitude goes softly out and does good works, which generate more gratitude. Gratitude is renewable energy. Gratitude, because to offer anything less would be to ignore all privilege. The privilege of existence, the privilege of health, the privilege of privilege. And now we're back at humility, or ought to be. Gratitude, because the world is awash with the sour surf of opposing sentiments. Gratitude for those who show us the same. Gratitude even in grumpiness, which is to say I'm not talking all hosannas, hugs, and puppies here. I'm talking about perspective and preponderance and relativity and a sideways glance into the cosmic mirror, where behind me I spy millions of souls who would give all they own for just one of my disappointing Tuesdays. Gratitude as my moral duty. Gratitude because it's so easy. A note, a word. You don't even have to talk. Gratitude can be soundless. You can speak it with your eyes, 
share it with a smile, weave it into your works. You can kneel down and offer it up. Gratitude. A triple, syllab a triple syllabic salutation to the six directions, whichever way you're pointing. The echoes go on and on. The echoes are gratitude returning. There's the idea among psychologists that gratitude can be cultivated. Put it out there and it comes back to you. Gratitude as a practice, as an intentional act in the form of reflection. A quiet moment, a look back. Gratitude not as obligation, but as celebration. Gratitude with our loved ones in mind, the ones who suffer our ingratitudes with grace, and that grace, yet another reason for gratitude. Grace, cousin and catalyst to gratitude. Gratitude because as this year, or this day, or this hour, or this moment draws to a close, I am reminded it was another year granted, not guaranteed, therefore not taken for granted. Gratitude, no matter the season. Gratitude. Thank you very much.